Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching the Salty Sea, and we have the rules for two brand new warbands that are coming out for pre order yesterday. Uh, you can buy them next week. I'm very excited about that. Now, before we get into the exact rules, everything, I'm going to do a full guide for these two warbands here on this video, but I just want to talk about. Uh, tempering your expectations and and how release schedules work really because I think in a way we had waited a long time for Pyre and Flood they were shown way back in January at LVO this is now April and sometimes waiting too long can start to warp your expectations right for example Hunter and Hunted was too perfect they dropped nine factions on us in six weeks which is wild uh it kind of redefined competitive play because wilder corps were really really good monster killers are really really good cities of sigmar the humans are really really good and then the dwarves both flavors of dwarves are just very solid the cities of sigmar dwarves and the vulcan flame seekers are very solid and then gorger maw packs are like the perfect painting project and full of little abilities and stuff that let you know that yes five model factions are going to struggle generally in war cry but it was full of things that make them playable and make them interesting and make them actually usable on the field in a way that not every five model warband is and so it was just a really incredible release and so i think it put a lot of people in a headspace where like oh my god everything is going to be incredible going forward and then here comes the test right because they are essentially making two teams of factions that are you know elf profiles and night haunt profiles which are probably the two worst types of profiles in the game so it was going to be a real test to see you know how much of they how much have they shown really from hunter and hunted or did, did they just kind of hit the lottery uh are they aware of the struggles that these types of teams have? And do they have things that can kind of fix that? And I think uh, <laughs> maybe that expectation was a little bit too high. Um, I'm not sure how they possibly could have lived up to that. I don't know if it was going to be possible with the current points algorithm to actually make an elf team and a ghost team and have both of them be you know really amazing in every single way but what they did give us was two pretty interesting factions that i think are going to be fun to play even if they're not going to rewrite the competitive sphere sphere and don't worry if you are looking for things that are going to help you win games if you if that's what you like to do there are six underworlds teams coming later this month i will be doing a video on those when they come out as well so let's get into the river blades and i'll start with their abilities because um i think it's pretty interesting here so the First one that I think is fun is uh, it's just called River Blades. <laughs> Until the end of this fighter's activation, add one to the fighter's move characteristic, and after each action this fighter takes, other than weight actions, roll a dice on a roll of two up. Deal one damage to one visible enemy fighter within eight inches. Eight is a long way. This ability is pretty low impact, so, you know, it's essentially rush with a bonus usually a bonus two damage every once in a while you'll miss one um <laughs> in a blue moon you know once every what is it 36 times you'll miss both uh but it's going to be very usable if that makes sense it's very low impact but very usable it'll be interesting a lot of the time i use rush not every game but most games and sometimes i'm using rush you know three or four times a game um if I could just get two damage in while I did that, that's just a really wonderful quality of life upgrade. It's not going to redefine any kind of faction. It's, you know, most of the time games are won and lost by powerful high impact abilities, even if they can be kind of requiring some setup. That's not going to be what this ability does for you but it's just going to be nice and you're going to enjoy playing it because it's just so easy to use and that's a great place to be uh rapids rising leap not going to read that it's not worth talking about same with white crest strike uh let's get into standing wave stance there is um 
There's a lot here. Let's just read it out. A fighter can only use this ability if this fighter has not made a move or disengage action this activation, and if a fighter uses this ability, they cannot make a move or disengage action this activation. Until the end of this fighter's activation, add one to the attacks and strength characteristic of melee attack actions made by this fighter, and until the end of the battle round, add plus one toughness to the fighter. This is really interesting. So a lot of the time when you're just going to be doing, hey, I'm going to roll double attacks here, you usually know before you do it. And so that's when you'll use standing wave stance and getting plus one attack and plus one strength and plus one toughness for afterwards is a whole lot. Now, as far as, you know, what are the defining triples of Warcry? This does not do even a fraction of what, say, Coordinated Strike does, um, or what Fight for Profit even does. But it's still very powerful and very interesting, and I think it'll be very fun. It really does boost the damage of one fighter, and getting into that five toughness situation is really necessary. I think there's a reason why Lumineth is the only elf faction that is really uh, powerful enough to play at an event or play, you know, at your local LGS where people might not necessarily purposefully play terrible warbands against you. Um, and the reason is because Lumineth is you know, equipped with multiple things to make them more survivable, uh, multiple defensive abilities. And this, I think, is your only defensive ability in the faction. But I think you're going to want to play it a lot just because staying alive as elves, staying alive as elves is uh, incredibly important because otherwise, if you just get mowed off the field, you know, elves are often very capable of going catching a lead in the first round or two, uh, but they die so quickly that that lead never stays. And so, you know, things like this that can give you real combat potential are things you'll probably use a lot. Let's talk about Release the River, aka Swift as the Wind. Uh, until the end of the battle round, add half the value of this ability to the move characteristic of friendly fighters while they make a move action that starts within six inches of this fighter. This is a classic. Uh, you know, orcs still have it, but it's really good in order. It always has been uh, back when it was Tempest Eye. Now, the cheapest way that you can access this is 205 points, whereas you used to be able to do it for 110 uh, and have little dwarves that were, you know, annoyingly hard to kill, and once they had released the river going, or sorry, swift as the wind going, uh, they were pretty fast. It's actually not going to do much in this faction because elves are already fast enough to get to most of the places they want to be on the board. Um, there's a lot of kind of speed boost here in terms of, you know, maybe not a lot, lot, but, uh, you know, river blades, uh, rapids rising leap is doing this, and release the river is doing this. Uh, this is kind of showing that maybe the designers don't really play Warcry necessarily the way I do or the way a lot of other people who go to tournaments do in that they're like taking this faction that's really fast and really fragile and going, man, how cool would it be if we gave them even more movement because rivers move. And what you need in a faction like this is kind of the opposite of that. But it is going to make the leader who has access to release the river a really interesting ally piece for a lot of factions because Swift as the Wind is just good. It's a good ability that any slow warband would be incredibly happy to have. Um, so, you know, things like Stormcast, things like any kind of dwarves, all those factions would be so happy to have access to release the river. And so I think you'll see the leader used as an ally quite a bit. Uh, finally, Boiling Wrath. It seems, I think, better than it is, like most quads. Uh, uh, this fighter makes a number of bonus actions, which may be any combination of move, attack, and disengage, equal to the number of fighters from this fighter's battle group that have been taken down. Uh, so they come with 10 fighters, right? So you can have one battle group with four, which seems like a whopping number, and then you just sprint forward and you, uh, you know, have all your people die and then uh, you get an incredible number of actions. The problem with that, and the reason that this isn't nearly as good as it reads, is because how easy is it really going to be for you to orchestrate for your opponent to kill, let's say, 
two little guys before they kill your leader, when they know that your leader is the person who sort of activates your entire warband. And if you're using this ability, Boiling Wrath, on anyone other than your leader, it's awful, right? Because bonus actions on like 100 point fighters, sometimes they do swing games because it's like everyone's limping and they barely have anything left and you just like you just like need to run halfway across the board for some reason. In those situations, it'll be good if you've lost three fighters and you're going to get, you know, five actions this this round. But in most situations, it's just like a lower value quad than I think what a lot of factions are getting. But it reads so cool. And when you do set it up and get it on your leader, getting, you know, three bonus actions for your leader, it's just going to feel incredible. You're going to feel like, you know, you are the river's wrath, you know, taking taking revenge for all the fish they've fished out of your river. I don't know <laughs> what to say about it, but you are going to love it when it does work. But don't ever take this faction being like, oh man, the quad, I'm going to just like totally destroy people with it. You're not. It does nothing in round one. It does nothing in round two. Round one is when you really, or round two is when you really need quads. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's just not going to be as good as, as you want it to be. Uh, but that's okay because, you know, they've got other cool stuff. I think Standing Wave Stance is really cool. River Blades is cool. Release the River is cool. Let's talk about their fighters. Uh, I'm going to start with the Pure Flood Seneschal. Every version is a little overcosted but solid. And they kind of need to be overcosted because if this guy was as cheap as he should be for his stat profile, you know, I'm talking like 190 points or so. Uh, that would be kind of too easy to ally in uh, because Release the River is, again, not very good in this warband, but in order generally, that is an, a wild ability to have access to. And so I get why this fighter is overcosted. Each version is solid and worth thinking about. Uh, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Crest Dancers are the 115 point ones with the masks. They are some of the coolest sculpts. Um, unfortunately, 115 points is just a lot to pay for 10 wounds. Uh, you can put them at 130 for giving them four more wounds if you want, but I hate giving that plus four wound blessing to anything that doesn't have toughness five because it's just like the four wounds don't mean as much at lower toughnesses. If I do have to pick, I think I would pick the Roped Sickle it's a little bit easier to stay safe with it. Um, you know, the, the damage outputs are actually really similar. And so three is just way more range than two. I know it doesn't seem like it because you're thinking about it in a straight line. But if you think about it as the area of a circle, you know, it's pi r squared. And when r is three, three squared, which is nine, is more than twice as much as four, as two squared, which is four. And so it's more than twice as much area you're covering when you have three inch range than it is when you have two. And when you only care about one target, it doesn't really feel that way. It feels like you're only getting a 50% benefit. But when you are setting up and then covering a wide swathe of the board, three inches feels wild in terms of range and being able to uh, put damage kind of in a whole bunch of different places you know when you have that one target you're thinking about when it finally gets taken down and you're surveying the board for what else you can hit a lot of the time you'll find an option uh when you have three inch range whereas you wouldn't have when you had two um it you really have to like see it on board to really believe it it's it's a huge difference um so i would go with the rope sickle i wouldn't waste my time with the spear even though i think the spear looks really cool let's talk about the stream runners they're really interesting. I've heard that there might, now I haven't seen the sprues and I don't think anyone has seen the sprues, but the way the warband is uh, built um, here, there is only one with the, what I would call crest blades. Well, that's what they call them, uh, which is the one that does four, three, one, two. Uh, that one does more damage and it has the reaction. It's better in every way. And so, that one is actually kind of interesting. The other one, the 3313 little elf, is some of the weakest chaff in all of order. It's, uh, you know, weaker than uh, 
a witch elf at the same cost. Uh, and witch elves are just weaker versions of other 65 point chaff that other grand alliances can get. Uh, so the one without the crest blades is like really embarrassingly bad. But the crest blades one is kind of interesting. So the way they built the box, there's only one per box. I'm really hoping that that's not the case, that there's multiple crest blades per box. If that is what's going on and there really is just like the one chaff model that does more damage and has a reaction that the other one doesn't have uh that would be really a shame if there's only one per box i would just say to your opponent hey i'm running them all as crest blades and no one's gonna know i can't tell the difference really i mean one is like a sickle like blade or you know just like a slightly different knife but they're still just people wearing suspenders with knives. I mean, who cares, right? So I would just run them all as crest blades regardless of what the sculpt is. I think that the practice of, you know, back when Hunters of Huanchi came out, right, and the, the one wearing a skull as a hat was way better than all the others, I would be like, oh man, who's going to possibly convert skull hats for all of their stupid things? Uh, I'm very impressed by all the people who made skull hats, but at this point, it's just like, tell your opponent you're running them all as skull hats because James Workshop is like a dirty, awful human being. So um, just run them all as crest blades. Crest blades are better in every single way. Let's talk about the leader and the different uh, builds we can do with the leader because I think it's worth kind of diving into a little bit more. Melee versions, uh, you get the Warglaive or you get the Master Blades. Uh, the Master Blades deal substantially more damage than the Warglaive war uh, in almost every situation, especially when you use Standing Wave and you get plus one attack and plus one strength. Getting the three hit, getting the plus one strength and getting three damage per hit and plus one attack is wild. Um, it's it's just a huge damage output once you do that. Uh, but you know the one thing that you do want to think about is at only 18 wounds for 210 points, toughness four. This is an extremely killable leader. This is a leader that oftentimes you will, if you're an aggressive player, you will get one attack action in and then he'll die before round three starts. And that's not what you want to have happen. And so in those situations, if you know yourself, if you know yourself to be the type of person who can't necessarily hold off with a fighter like that, uh, just use the Warglaive because it's more flexible. Um, it's less reliant on the triple because it's not so much like I'm going to come in here, I'm going to set up, and then I'm going to do huge damage on my opponent. It's more like uh, ability to kind of run around, stay out of reach, maybe have your little guys engage, and then he's fighting over the top of them, things like that. Uh, there's just like a lot more you can do with it, even though it's much weaker. So, uh, if you kind of want to be a little bit careful, use the Glaive, even though it's less powerful. Uh, the one that I'm the most excited about, though, is the Darts. It's a completely different fighter. You're not doing big damage with it the way you are with the Blades. Uh, I would actually hesitate to use the Darts version when running River Blades as pure River Blades because they don't really have a lot of damage output. And so you kind of, there is a lot of pressure on you to use the melee versions because the melee versions can pop out a lot of damage. And that's, a, there's just missions where you need to be able to do that. And the darts can't do that. But what the darts do give you is a 13 inch chaff hunting threat uh, in terms of move five, shoot eight which is great. Very few things can hide from it. 13 inches is a lot on the board. Um, and then it's also really happy to just like move six to where, or move five to where two different deployment groups are within six inches of it, then pop, release the river. Tons of missions like, like set up so that you can do that. Uh, then pop, release the river and let you get your whole warband released through the river. Um, so this is more like as an ally, it's able to do something like this and then it can still shoot from there, right? So something like move once, pop, release the river, shoot once, and then like your whole warband flies into combat, something like that. Um, or just like even just sitting still, popping, release the river, and then shooting twice is something that the darts are perfectly happy to do um, and the melee ones really don't want to be doing. 
The melee ones can do some cool tricks with Release the River where all of a sudden they have move eight and they're, you know, getting all the way across the board. So now you can threaten damage onto something that uh, your opponent thought you could never possibly threaten damage onto next turn. But again, this is something that is next turn and it's really easy to overextend with that leader. I would like for 90% of players, be really careful, man. Uh, And it's, there's nothing wrong with, shying away from the harder to play fighters because you know losing losing with really hard to play stuff can be really frustrating because people tell you like oh these are really powerful and you just like you feel stupid if you can't win with it but just like don't worry about that just play the stuff that's easy to play it's better for everyone um, and so i think that the darts are going to be much easier to play because they shoot and they just give you a lot more flexibility you can actually do more clever tricks with them it's just like the risk and the reward is less um and also you know swift as the wind it used to be if you popped it and ran twice sometimes your previous people wouldn't be nearby so you wouldn't actually want to run your whole distance but you really wanted to get that fighter into combat uh, that can be a real problem with iron jaws for example i actually recently won a game where my opponent was forced in this awful sophie's choice where he had to pop wa to run up to get to where he was threatening to kill me on objectives but then to run the whole distance with wa with his leader uh he actually left behind the rest of his warband and they weren't able to follow up to count on the objective which was just like a really bad situation for him to be in but i don't think he had a better option etc 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 because uh that's the issue with having a melee fighter using swift as the wind type you know release the river type abilities uh having a shooter with that really changes how you use it and so that's really nice um another thing about the leader is the ally potential is pretty wild uh it has the elite rune mark there's only so many things with the elite rune mark cities of sigmar goes crazy when they have elite rune mark friends to ally in and especially being able to use release the river for cities of sigmar which has a lot of slow dudes um is just an incredibly powerful option for them, something that they are very excited about. And if you play Cities of Sigmar, you should absolutely consider buying Riverblades just for the leader because the leader is so good in Cities of Sigmar. Uh, Release the River is also good in other factions. Uh, Fire Slayers is pretty into it because, you know, they have a lot of points-efficient chaff that they have a really tough time getting into position. It's not like... um, say KO where they can afford not to get into position in round one because they blow you off the objectives as well. Fire Slayers, again, incredibly point points efficient, very good fighters, but they can't necessarily afford to not get into position round one. And so that's where uh, your pure flood seneschals really, really help giving them release the river. So all of that on the leader, it's because I think the leader is so cool. Again, overcosted for its points but you're paying for the abilities and so it's a very hard piece to use but it is going to be very interesting and i think that it's the one thing from this box that uh will be played competitively for a long time let's talk about some lists uh my version the the version i'm going to play quite a bit locally is a pure flood seneschal with darts uh one crest dancer with the roped sickle five stream runners with crest blades an Annihilator Prime, and a Vulcan Rune Father. Uh, this warband is desperate for some hitting power. It's desperate for some offense. I really sh- want to shy away from the melee versions. I think so much can go wrong when you play them that I really want to be playing the darts version. The problem with the darts version is it just doesn't do any damn damage, right? And so it's really good at killing chaff, but it can't kill anything else. And so you need guys who can fight. And the Vulcan Rune Father is a great little fighter for 150 points when it's using its um, ability. I think Ignite Weapons is what it's called. It deals a lot of damage, which is really nice. The Annihilator Prime, of course, is a legend. Um, you know, his reputation precedes him. There's nothing you need to say about him. Uh, and then Stream Runner is just for some chaff. I know there's a lot of things in order that have better chaff, but. Um, being able to move quick. I've found often when you have slow allies, you want to be bringing them in for a faction with fast chaff. If you have 
slow chaff. You want to be bringing in kind of faster allies. Um, and so having these kind of being able to run up, get up on your opponent on points, and then follow in with the really good fighters so that your opponent can't necessarily just clear you off the objective that easy, right? Like you disengage with your chaff as they aggress onto you, and now here comes your Annihilator Prime, uh, you know, <laughs> ready to uh, to let anyone who's been bullying his little friends know what's really up. Um, so that's how I'm going to play them. You will probably see me at a tournament at some point with these, but you will definitely see me locally with them, uh, trying them out a few times like this. Uh, how I think a lot of people are going to run River Blades is with Haskell Hexbane and Quiet Poc. Uh, this kind of gives you the reach that sort of not playing the darts allows you to, uh, you know, you get the offense from having the blades and then, you know, you get the reach so that you don't miss having the darts there. And then three stream runners with crest blades, uh, grot biter, rat spike. And so you still have five, uh, you know, five little guys. And then Kalthia Zandire, because Kalthia giving Quiet Poc free bonus attacks. If you ever set it up so that you can get Quiet Poc and the blade Seneschal a bonus, uh, action in the same turn with Kalthia. That is going to be absolutely insane. Um, again, this is not necessarily at the top tier of competitive play, but this is something that uh, will be pretty effective against any warband that's not competitively tuned. <laughs> and so, you know, there's kind of this situation where like River Blades have enough tools that you can order soup them up and make them pretty effective. But then it's like, are they just worse versions of other warbands? Yes, they are, but you can still make them effective. Uh, this version, though, of course, only has four actual river blades in it, but hey, that's fine because you have the Seneschal with blades, and that guy's just so cool on his own, especially using Standing Wave, that I think it's legitimately worth, you know, souping up just so that you can feel like you're playing him in a powerful situation. Uh, I also wanted to give a sample Fire Slayers warband with a Hearthguard Carl, the Pure Flood Seneschal with darts, Kixi Taka, a Hearthguard Berserker Broadaxe, and four Berserkers with hand axes. Uh, this is just kind of a first draft of how I would try Fire Slayers with how the Pure Flood Seneschal can kind of be a game changer for them because they've got those efficient bodies. In retrospect, I don't know if I would bring in Odapodal and Zepic. I might actually spend those points on more Berserkers because the Seneschal with darts actually does what Odapodal does, essentially, and so I'm not sure you need both of them. But Berserkers with hand axes are the 70-point, uh, really efficient, great offense dwarves with toughness 4, 12 wounds. Their damage really adds up over time, and Kixitaka being able to give them plus one move and plus one toughness is really strong. The Pure Flood Seneschal being able to give them plus like three move is really strong, and so you can really put a lot of damage onto your opponent. This is a you know list where the chaff are threats, and I love playing lists like that. They can be really fun. Um, my only issue is that, unfortunately, um, Fire Slayers are not the most enjoyable paint scheme you know like let's just say they fix fire slayers with vulcan flame seekers and uh there's a reason they said fixed because vulcan flame seekers are amazing but i don't love the uh the the way every sculpt kind of looks similar on original fire slayers anyway more river lists because these were all very soupy and i get some people are offended by that uh so i wanted to give some pure lists first is how i would run river blades with two boxes uh, I would do one with the blades, one with the darts, and then I would do the Crest Dancer with Roped Sickle, and then I would run seven Stream Runners. Uh, the idea here is, you know, ten fighters, you're putting a lot of people on the board so that you sort of have the advantage in activations and objective missions, and then, um, you know, just the two Seneschals, you have one that can really put some damage out there and one that can uh, really attack your opponent's ability to out-activate you in terms of the one with the darts is just so good at picking off little chaff models from across the board. Um, and so that would really be your plan here is just to get to the points, score a lot of points with your little stream runners, and then um, kind of 
cripple your opponent's ability to do the same with your pure flood seneschals. The idea here is to really dance around your opponent's big combat pieces. You know, stay away from them. Your crest dancer has got a uh, long range. Everyone else is fast, and so you're just trying to kind of play keep away while picking off your opponent's little stragglers. You know, you should eventually try, you should be trying to win games with, you know, only five of your fighters surviving and only having killed like two of your opponent's fighters, but having just like frustrated them for long enough that you just end up up on points. If you want to play them punchy though, because this is an issue that a lot of these factions that don't actually fight have is people play them and then they end up not liking them because they don't end up fighting and most people play Warcry because they want to fight, right? So if you want to fight with Yadrillin Riverblades, warning, they're not the best faction for that, but you can bless up the leader and go pretty crazy with them. Uh, you do a mighty pure flood with darts uh, so that you get the four, five, two, three profile. So now you aren't just shooting down chaff. You can shoot down a lot of different types of things. Uh, 230 for a mighty pure flood with blades. So that again, you're getting the extra strength with the uh, three damage base, which is wild. The sort of output increase that that gives you is pretty huge. Uh, and then you have a brutal pure flood with glaive. Again, this is the one that already has five strength. Now you're giving it three damage on each of its hits. And so all three of those sort of really increase your damage output with your pure flood. And then you just have three little people with suspenders and one crest dancer with roped sickle. You'll, no you'll notice every single list I write, uh, I guess except for one, um, is going to have one crest dancer with roped sickle. I think it's not the most point sufficient, but I think the utility it gives you is just so sweet that um, I would never pass one of them up but I wouldn't want to be spamming them across the board for the same reasons, right? Uh, so a lot of cool stuff you can do with Riverblades. They're not particularly powerful. Again, as far as chaff spamming, there are just stronger chaff that you can be spamming. Um, you know, eight wounds is not a lot, but they're pretty cool. They have the shape of a powerful warband, if that makes sense. You know, there's only so bad you can be when you have 65 point fighters on your team. Uh, because, you know, you can kind of get some stuff done. Now, that said, Daughters of Cain have 65-point fighters, and they are pretty bad. Uh, though you don't generally see people, like, spam tons of Witch Elves, and I think that that would lead you to something a little bit better than what's average on Daughters of Cain. Anyway, that's a side, a side thing. But uh, there's only so bad that Riverblades can be. They're not dropping in straight into, you know, D-tier or anything, but they're just not going to shake competitive play that's okay because they still do a thing and they you'll still get to like play Warcry with them. Uh, Pirate guys kind of in a similar spot, but they are much cooler than you normally see with Warbands. What do I love about Pirate guys? Um, you know, when we get to some of the profiles, I think, you know, you'll hear me change my tune. But what I think is incredible about Pirate guys is the new design space that they are plumbing with this. So I wanted to get straight into the a uh, little Fire Ghost ability suite. Here's some pictures of Fire Ghost, just so that you really feel like we're moving into this. Uh, instead of having a reaction, they don't have a reaction. They have Bale Fire Cremation. When an ability tells you to cremate a fighter, I'll get to that in a moment, remove that fighter from the battlefield and place a Pyre token at the center of the space occupied by that fighter. At the end of the battle round, after determining control of objectives, allocate three damage to each enemy fighter within one inch of the center of one or more Pyre tokens. Let's look at which abilities let you cremate a fighter. We have Pyre Robber's Curse, we have Light the Pyre, and we have Agonizing Penance. I wish there were one more, but, you know, there's only so much we can do. The thing that's so incredible is the fact that this is the first time we've seen Allegiance abilities come to Warcry matched play. I think that that is, like, truly mind-blowing. They really buried the lead here. Um, I would have, you know, I would have put Johnny Bracken on a video being like, Pyre Geist have completely changed the game with how we design factions because they have not having a reaction, having like a static allegiance ability is just so different than anything we've done before. I love seeing it. 
Um, now, the only reason that you're not seeing me like explode all over the place here is because I think maybe because this is so game changing, they were very cautious with how powerful they allowed this to be. Um, you only get one inch radius. You know, I already talked about how three is double two is more than twice as much as two when it comes to circles. Uh, two is four times as much as one uh, when it comes to circles. And so one inch radius is not a lot. You've got to make a lot of pyres before they really start to add up. And you need to have them adding up in round three with how it's written, right? At the end of the battle round, after determining control of objectives, allocate three damage. So you're not really racking up points. Like if you have a bunch of pyres finally in round four, that's not really doing much for you. You need to kill stuff before that, right? Um, especially because it's after determining control of objectives. So they already score the points on you. They already beat you. Um, so you really need lots of pyres by round three to facilitate then taking control of the board in round four, right? Um, and it's just going to be too hard to do that, unfortunately. It's just going to be very hard to do that because you only have so many abilities that can. Uh, so then it really leads you to this situation where do you want to maximize your pyres or do you want to maximize a very powerful triple that they did give you? And I do love that they sort of gave you this pyre sort of focus, uh, but then they gave you kind of an out if you want to do something else. Uh, so that triple is Soul Blaze. A fighter can only use this ability if an enemy fighter has been taken down this battle round. Pick a number of visible friendly fighters with the Pyre Geist's rune mark, equal to half the value of this ability. Each fighter you picked can make a bonus move action or a bonus attack action. Some can be bonus move, some can be bonus attack. This is essentially coordinated strike, but much worse. Coordinated strike is one of the defining abilities of the game. Basically, it's just a not faction locked version of this where you don't have to get a kill to do it. Uh, getting a kill is not going to be that difficult, but it is going to just cramp your style a little bit. It's going to change the order of when you can do this. A lot of the time, you're going to want to use this ability very first thing you do in the round. But if your leader, the Deacon of Flames, isn't like in combat with something, it's going to be like really you're going to be sweating about how am I going to get a kill with this guy so that I can pop the ability Soul Blaze so I can get a ton of value before my opponent starts picking me apart. Um, it's going to be kind of tough. It's it's just going to be much harder to use. The fact that it's faction locked means you can't do really broken things with it, like ally in big death fighters. Death doesn't have the biggest, scariest fighters, but it does have some. Right, and so you're not going to be able to like ally them in and do big things with them. Uh, that's just not going to work, unfortunately. So you're kind of stuck there, but it's still powerful. It's still you're still in a situation where you are getting three activations for the price of a triple, which is wild. Um, and even on cheaper, less powerful fighters, that's still going to feel very, very powerful when you get it going. And so that's kind of a nice place to be for if you decide to end up giving up on the pyres. And it gives you kind of two play styles. You can either lean into the allegiance ability or you can decide not to. Uh, the quad is kind of hilarious. Pick a visible enemy fighter within six of this fighter. That enemy fighter makes a bonus move action directly towards the closest other fighter in their warband as if they were jumping. Uh, you can force them to disengage from you by doing this, which is kind of nice. After that move action, allocate three damage points to that fighter and each other enemy fighter within two inches of that fighter. So you just like flop over, deal three impact damage, and then if you get any kills from it, you get to cremate those things. Um, it's really sweet. It's not going to be usable most of the time, but when it is usable, it's going to be hilarious because you can get someone off of an objective that way, things like that. Um, you can potentially like get someone off, like if you're really worried about someone's big gut lord being about to kill one of your little guys, you can force it off of it, which is really nice. So now you're not in danger anymore. That's amazing for treasure missions when you're on defense. There's a lot of potential uses for this, 
but it's going to be hard to set it up to get like the real dream situation. Uh, I don't think you're going to be lighting a lot of pyres with this ability, for example, but it's, it's still useful and you'll occasionally be happy that you have it as a quad. Uh, let's talk about the fighters themselves. First is the Deacon. The Deacon is pretty points inefficient, but has a lot of flexible, interesting use cases here. Uh, the first being that, you know, if you want to be just running Soul Blaze a lot with him, uh, he has interesting utility for confirming kills, right? He's got the 2424 shooting profile, so things can, you know, he can pick off stragglers. Um, with the two inch range, he can often sort of put himself in a position to be able to attack whichever fighter is lower to be able to then use Soul Blaze, things like that. Uh, both loadouts are kind of interesting in that they're good at killing different things. So, you know, depending on what your metagame is, that can be interesting. I don't spot any difference in the two pictures other than just the head. Uh, and so I would say you can just use whatever loadout you want. Now, obviously don't like wait until your opponent is there and then be like, hmm, which loadout do I want now that I'm looking at your warband? Uh, that's pretty rude. But um, in terms of like, deciding day to day like you can just pick one and, and go with it uh, and I'll get into a little bit more sort of which loadout is better in which situation um, the balefire guard are pretty interesting this is generally going to be where your damage output comes from uh, the one inch range version with the 4424 profile that profile can be a little disappointing for a 130 point fighter uh, that's kind of where night haunts an odd spot they pay so much for that fly keyword but uh, when using Fan the Flames, it can incinerate chaff. It's incredible. Uh, and so the sort of 3-5 damage output when you have 4-4 four, four is really, really good. Now, the 2-inch reach version is sort of m more interesting if you're not necessarily boosting it up with Fan the Flames. Maybe you're using Onslaught, something like that, because, uh, you know, the 5 for the strength gives you kind of a different range of things you can fight on interesting terms. Um, and of course, both of these have that toughness five that'll let them stick around a little bit longer, uh, though it does, you know, maybe sting a little bit that there's factions that can get T5 12 wounds for uh, not much more than half this price. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Torch Wraiths are really inefficient, but they are your best hope for making pyres. When you pop the ability, you get plus one strength, and so that gives you a 26% chance of making a pyre from a T3-8 wound fighter. Uh, the elves are full of T3-8 wound fighters, so uh, that's a really good sort of percentage to know if you're just playing within the box. Now, that's not very good, right? And so you kind of want to be softening up your opponent's fighters before you hit them with Torch Wraiths. Uh, when you're doing this with just one box, that's going to be easy because Flame Wraiths are in the box. They don't do a lot of damage. Uh, so they're generally going to you know weaken whatever they hit and then your Torch Wraith can then finish it off. Uh, there's a lot of two inch reach here, for example. So you can often attack onto something, not actually close the distance with it so that you can still shoot at it with a torch wraith. They clearly thought about that in terms of giving you at least one two inch reach option for each fighter. Um, and then if you're not too worried about finishing off with torch wraiths, you can just move in and use the uh, one inch reach version. Flame wraiths are kind of interesting. I would certainly go with the two inch reach version specifically so that you can enable your torch wraiths. But the one inch reach one does do something with fan the flames. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. Fan the Flames is pretty good on a 1-3 profile, but I'm just not interested in using doubles to buff, you know, tiny 1-3 fighters. It's, it's just not a good enough proposition. It's not interesting enough. So um, in general, I think I'd save my dice for my bigger fighters so that I can get, you know, bigger numbers on my damage output. Otherwise, Flame Race, you know, you're probably going to try to avoid putting them in lists, honestly, uh, they're just not worth running, <laughs> if I'm being honest with you. Uh, let's talk about the Deacon, because the Deacon is really cool and also looks really cool. Uh, how do we build it? I don't think it matters how you build it in real terms, because the picks are identical. We don't have the sprues yet. Maybe there's a difference between the staff and the tongs. I don't even know. I haven't seen any tongs on any of the pictures, but that's what they say they are. So anyway, 
if you plan on buffing, the tongs are the um, the one with the higher strength. The the three attack strength five one are supposedly with tongs, and they are a bite. Again, none of this makes any sense. Uh, your other fighters already deal with toughness three, and so I wouldn't worry about the fact that the staff is so much better at killing toughness three. Uh, if you plan on just like fan the flamesing and trying to maximize your damage, go with the tongs because they do more damage to toughness four, more damage to toughness five. Those are the two more most important things to be damaging in the game generally. Um, and so, and again, the rest of your warband really, really mows down toughness three. So I would go with the tongs if I was planning on just like really fighting a lot with the deacon. Uh, but if I'm planning to do like Soul Blaze combos, the staff is a lot better because it's just better to just confirm kills on small things really easily without using dice. Um, and the the one with the 4425 profile is much better at doing that um, in terms of your ability to just, if you see something that's toughness three and small, you can smack it and then you can Soul Blaze really easily without necessarily needing to lean on dice to do so. So I would go with the staff. Now, things do get kind of interesting when we talk about blessings. If you give plus one attack to the staff, it becomes an absolute chaff blender. DPA is 12.5 in one attack. Uh, if you use fan the flames and you're going against toughness three, that's really interesting. Um, otherwise, though, in other situations, you know, I'd probably bless the staff with strength because uh, when you bless it with strength and use Onslaught, that's kind of a, a better sort of output than the plus one attack on anything other than Chaff. Tongs, though, with plus one attack are, I think, much better all around. If you look at the sort of graphs right here on the right, um, at every toughness, the Tongs are just running circles around the plus strength blessing. Uh, the only one where the plus one attack blessing on the staff is better than the Tongs is specifically against toughness three. Against every other toughness, you'd rather have the Tongs. Um, or sorry, I think against toughness six, it starts to catch up again. But against four and five, which again are the most important ones to be attacking, uh, the Tongs just absolutely crush. Um, just in general, it's the best all around. It's just not specifically good at dealing 12 damage exactly to Toughness 3 Dwarves. Uh, so if you hate KO, don't use the Tongs. But if you hate KO, you're probably not playing this Warband, right? Uh, either one, though, I think the blessing to look at the most is plus 4 wounds. It costs 205 points for that blessing. Uh, and the whole point here is to just keep them alive, to keep Soul Blaze going. Uh, but I will just say that the plus 1 attack Tongs are pretty interesting. Let's get to some lists, because uh, I think that if you ignore power level, you can actually do some really cool stuff with these guys. Uh, the first list I'm going to do is kind of a pure list where you're just thinking about Soul Blaze. Um, you've got a Ferocious Deacon of Flames with the Tongs doing a bunch of damage. Uh, you have a regular Deacon of Flames with the Staff, three Balefire Guard, or Ball Fire Guard, as I wrote there, um, two Flame Wraith. That was a terrible typo. The point here is that if you're playing pure, you probably don't have a good way to enable your Torch Wraiths. Yes, you can just kind of aggress at two-inch reach and hope, but that's going to be hard to do. And so you're going to want to go with your heavier hitters and just try to set up like big soul blazes. Um, you know, if you can, the dream here, right, because soul blaze is faction locked, the real dream is to have two deacons um, because the whole point here is you soul blaze and you only want to be hitting balefire guards and deacons with your soul blaze because getting a free action on a deacon of flames is a really big deal. Getting a free action on the balefire guards is really solid. Getting a free action on a Torch Wraith, not that exciting. Um, so you really want to be sort of boosting up your heavier hitters with your Soul Blazes. And so that's why I would go with two Deacons, one of them with huge damage output, and just try to get as much as you can get going there. Uh, another option that's like completely different, and one thing I do like about Pyrogeist, again, the Power level is not very high, but the sort of versatility is great. Um, I do think that both of these warband, 
Actually, no, I don't think the river blades are that well designed, but I do think that the pyrogeists are really well designed. They're just not particularly well developed, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I don't think that they were really necessarily tested enough. Uh, but going with objectives, right? The Deacon of Flames with Staff, a Sepulchral Warden, this is the Underworld's Warbands that is just skeletons. Uh, the Sepulchral Warden, Petitioner with Sword, the Harvester, two Petitioners with Sword and Shield. The rules do allow two of this profile because the Underworld's Warband comes with two identical looking skeletons with a sword and shield. Uh, so you get to bring them both. And then three Torch Wraiths and one Balefire Guard. I love the idea of this warband. I want to try it on TTS at some point. Uh, you could really only run it if you were expecting a swarm meta, uh, something like a very, a, a pack that has a lot of objective missions, something like that, or just like your buddies all run just really high chaff warbands uh, for whatever reason in your local club. Um, but if that's the case, this is a really great situation because the Skeletons are really good at softening things up without necessarily killing it, uh, and they will also generally die. And so, you know, when something kills one of your fighters, all of a sudden it's not in combat anymore and you can just shoot at it. Um, or the Torch Wraiths, of course, can do their thing while just like walking up within three. Uh, they can essentially still shoot into combat there because they have no minimum range. And so, this is kind of a warband that's actually going to be good at softening up targets for your torch wraiths to spend a double to make a pyre the only really situation when pyres are going to be really good in warcry is on objective missions where uh a pyre is going to be like a significant chunk of the little objective right um it's going to be you know one ninth of the objective is now covered by this little pyre and anyone who strays within it is uh, going to take three damage and that's a great place to be. And so if you can put two pyres on one objective, all of a sudden it's actually kind of hard to fit most bases there without then just taking three damage. That's where you want to be. That's where the damage output from this warband actually starts to not be embarrassing. And so I'm really excited about this you know list this setup uh but i just want to warn you that it's just not going to work in every type of mission i think uh in any mission where your opponent can just kind of avoid the pyres you're going to have a bad time um and that's a lot of missions this uh this pyre mechanic is really only going to work in certain situations this is a very objective forward warband which is funny because they only give you eight fighters and then they t give you an ability that only does things in objective games kind of cruel but um i think the point of the ability is like it just needs to the point of it is that it allows you to cover objectives right with your only eight fighters but really what they're telling you they want you to do is just ally in a pile of skeletons and just be a pure you know live your life be your own sunshine uh you know be the <laughs> hearth to your own room of just like going all in on objectives. And I think that this would be a pretty effective way to do it. Um, you know, would you want to play this against Horns of Hushut? No, of course not. But it's still going to be very functional in those types of packs and uh, in those types of missions. And so if your local club does tend to be pretty swarm heavy, uh, this is how I would do it. And I think this way you can at least like make some pyres with your torch race and have a lot of fun that way you're definitely going to be feeling like you are doing the thing with this kind of setup uh i wanted to make a list that kind of goes halfway in between these i wanted to be able to set up good soul blazes um, but also have a torch wraith to maybe make some pyres too i'm not convinced that this list is amazing but then again king velmorn is really good thane is really good helmar is really good so when you have those in your warband you can only be so bad uh this is what i'm calling dirty blazon uh it feels dirty because we're using velmorn and his kids uh but if you have a resilient deacon of flames keep him alive uh king velmorn for 160 points he's actually a pretty decent combat piece and then thane and helmar are just like very efficient little guys they can soften things up for your torch wraiths again the balefire guards um you might be tempted to just use the two inch reach version even though i generally prefer the one inch reach version uh you are still having a torch wraith here so maybe you at least want one two inch reach version uh so you can shoot into combat on it 
uh, they are going to be doing actual damage. So now your Deacon of Flames can use Soul Blaze, but you have the one Torch Wraith who can make Pyres, and uh, that's just kind of a nice place to be. The, the triple, you'll notice I haven't really mentioned it with any of these lists for making Pyres, uh, because spending a triple just to make a Pyre is really bad. Uh, Blood for the Blood God is, like, generally never as good as you want it to be, and it's only a double. Uh, you know, the only faction that really makes it look good is Ogres, and uh, that's just because they're so darn big. Uh, you don't have anything as big as an Ogre here. So it's not good, but you will have, every once in a while, you'll make a Pyre with it. So this is a list that's kind of trying to be both a Soul Blaze list and a Pyre list. I would be interested in this if I were going to play this Warband casually. This is actually where I'd go, is trying to do both, because... I wouldn't be that concerned about necessarily winning. I would just want to feel like I'm doing the thing. And this Warband is the one that gives you the best chance to do the thing both ways, uh, which kind of you split the difference, even though you might not necessarily be as good in either situation. I actually think this might be better at Soul Blazing than the pure one. Uh, you won't get as many wild Soul Blazes off, but you do have Velmorn, Thane, and Helmar, which are just better fighters than anything that's in the Pyrogeist. Either way, a uh, pretty interesting way to do it. I wanted to do some closing thoughts on these guys. I think in general, you know, now that we've talked about where they are, um, neither of them are going to be, you know, competitively viable. Uh, and I know a lot of people, most of my viewers are casual players, and yet there is the paradox that, Almost all casual players are more interested in competitive content than casual content. Uh, like Goonhammer does surveys for this like every couple of years. Uh, they com they Every single time they get this feedback that most of their readers are casual players. Most of their um, readers, despite being casual players, are more interested in competitive content than casual content. So I do just want to let you know at least... These are not competitive warbands. Full stop, right? You are not going to go to a tournament full of players who are pretty skilled and necessarily like have a good chance of going 4-0 with these warbands. Uh, someone will eventually win a tournament somewhere with these warbands. That's just how dice games work, right? So then people are going to be like, oh, you know, you were so wrong. Look how wrong you were. Uh, I can't wait for that to happen. I'll be so happy for that person when they pull it off. But in general, um, I don't expect these to win a lot of games. But I think the Pyrogeists have an absolutely fascinating design philosophy. I think these are, this is the best designed warband that I think they've ever come out with. I think they're absolutely beautiful from a mechanical standpoint. I think Allegiance abilities are so interesting. There's so many places they can go. And the fact that they just did this with the Pyrogeist just proves that they're willing to. And I think future Allegiance ability warbands are going to be so cool. I would love if only half the warbands in the game had a reaction and the rest had an Allegiance ability like this. Uh, that would be so cool. So I love that. It's just like they were too cautious with the numbers, probably because, honestly, it's the first time they've ever done this and they wanted to be really careful. They didn't want to like break everything, right, and create bad experiences that way. Maybe they just tested a lot within this box where the Pyrogeists are kind of a soft counter to the elves, um, even though the elves are much better than them. Uh because, you know, they light pyres on kill, well, who's easier to kill than Suspender Elves? Nothing, right? The only thing in the game easier to kill than Suspender Elves is Noblars. So um, I think maybe they just, like, tested within the box, and when the ability was better, I bet they were just, like, ranching Elves off the board, and so they probably made it more cautious, uh, without thinking necessarily about the fact that the Elves are really bad. Um, now let's get to the Elves. I think the Elves are, in general, going to be much more powerful in a wider array of situations than the uh, Ghosts are, um, at least when you are 
playing elves, for example, because they have a 65 point fighter. You can only be so bad when you at least have some chaff to play with. Um, of course, you know, if you play with underworlds, the, uh, the ghosts have chaff too, and that helps them catch up quite a bit. But, um, the elves are in this interesting situation where everything is built towards flavor. And I respect that. Uh, mechanically, I don't think they're necessarily interesting. None of the the abilities give you a lot of what you already have, and they don't necessarily make what you already have overwhelming, right? Just getting a plus three move on your plus five guys that don't do anything is not going to like blow your opponent away. It's not going to like auto win a treasure mission because you lose so much tempo with it, things like that. Um, so it's just, it, that's kind of a tough situation with the elves. It's kind of an awkward design choice. Um, but the leader is so cool and it's going to be something that you can use forever. And the elves can only be so bad. Like I said, like once you start souping with them, uh, they're going to be pretty competent in a way that like, I think they'll be a little bit easier to use than the ghosts are. They're going to be a little bit sort of, I think probably more widely played for that reason. Although... I always underestimate how much people like death as a grand alliance because i don't i don't like any of the sculpts in the death grand alliance except for like a couple of the flesh eater courts ones uh and so i always underestimate how much people are going to love various nagash minions um uh, that's not fair i actually like a lot of ocr bone reaper sculpts i could see myself playing ocr bone reapers one day anyway uh I don't know which one will be played more is I guess what I'm saying, but I do think that the elves uh, empower you to build a warband that is the shape of a successful warband much more easily, and that will let you win more games. I think it'll just be easier to win games in more situations with the elves, um, even though I think from a design standpoint, they're just kind of odd and some odd choices and some maybe indications that they aren't as aware of the problem that elves in Warcry have more generally uh, as I thought they were. That was a sentence with too many little sub-tangents in it, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, elves are really bad in Warcry. I really hope that this elf team would show that they know what elves need in order to succeed in Warcry. It did not do that. It's just like a vaguely competent team that is going to be C-tier forever. Uh, <laughs> and that's fine. Things are allowed to be in C-tier. C-tier is really fun. But I would have loved to see maybe a little bit more consciousness about like why elves are struggling. And uh, we didn't see that, and that's okay. Um, I don't feel too bad about that because, you know, at least the sculpts are cool and... That's where we're at, right? Uh, editions don't last forever. The pendulum always swings. And, you know, if we ever get into an edition where stacking more movement on your already fast elves that don't do anything is actually really good, which, you know, these things can have very subtle changes very quickly, right? Like, ever since they nerfed Rampage, shooting has been the best thing to do in Warcry. And that, like, was shown very slowly as like a very subtle shift, even though it was probably true from day one, right? Um, so that's a big tangent to say that I was initially kind of disappointed with this release when I first read through it, but these are both at least really cool. And I think people are going to have a lot of fun with these. Uh, as long as you don't think about them too competitively, I think you're going to enjoy them quite a bit. Um, I've only seen a couple sneak peeks of the narrative rules, but the... Uh, ghosts have probably the coolest encampment that has ever been done for Warcry narrative. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. But the encampment that the ghosts get is incredible. So there's a lot that's fun here, even if necessarily they're not going to be some of the more winning teams that are out there. Uh, so I will be talking more about, you know, Warcry in future videos. And until then, may all your roles be crits.